uh, question time. The, uh, the member for Rowe. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Premier. I refer to the 2016-17 Gaming and Wagering Commission annual report, where it is stated that Chairman Barry Sargent was stood down from this role as a result of the Labor government's machinery of government changes, and I ask, one, was it wise to replace Barry Sargent, a person with 25 years of gaming regulation experience, with someone with no previous experience in gaming regulation? And two, was there training or support offered to the incoming chair to equip him with the skills required for this complex role? Uh, Madam Speaker, um, I recall uh Vaguely, the events uh, in, uh, at that point in time. Uh, the government went through in mid-2017 uh, the machinery of government changes. So in Western Australia, at that point in time, when we came to office, there was 41 government departments, the most of any state or territory in Australia. As I said on radio this morning, uh, Victoria had eight, or has eight. Uh, Jeff Kennett reduced uh, a few score down to eight, uh, and that's continued ever since uh, the Kennett government. Uh, New South Wales has 15 or 17 or thereabouts. Queensland has less than 20, has around 22 or thereabouts, uh, and so on across Australia. So the West Australian government took uh, action on this, which was well overdue, and reduced the number of agencies from 41 uh, down to 25. Government departments from 41 down to 25. The reason uh, behind that was you develop synergies between agencies with things in common, uh, and you also reduce red tape and have uh, greater. Uh, uh, less, less investment in bureaucracy, if you like, and more investment in delivery. And that was the reason behind the reform which we put in. As I said, they weren't as uh, stark as Victoria or other states, uh, but they were still significant. It was a 40 per cent reduction uh, in the number of government departments. When we did that, of course, there was then fewer opportunities for people in director general or CEO roles. Uh, I, my recollection at the time is Barry Sargent, who I am uh, quite, uh, quite, quite fond of. Uh, he was uh, a DG I had back in the 2000s uh, when we did the small bar reforms. Uh, he uh, decided of his own accord uh, that he didn't want to be. Uh, he, he elected not to be, sorry, didn't want, not, not didn't want to be, but he elected not to uh, be the uh, Director General of the new agency. That was his choice. Uh, at that point in time. He actually suggested to me that Duncan Ord was the appropriate person to undertake that role. Uh, and so I listened to Mr Sargent's advice, I listened to the Minister's advice of the time, I think it was uh, the member for Mandurah as a relevant minister, uh, and I uh, appointed Mr Ord uh, to the role. And he's a highly respected public servant uh, in uh, Western Australia, well liked. I think he was a Director General when uh, the Liberals and Nationals uh, were in office, and he assumed the role. Obviously, uh, we called a Royal Commission recently. It will look into all these issues. Uh, I'm not going to preempt uh, the outcomes of the Royal Commission. Madam Supplementary. Speaker. Supplementary to the member for Rome. Uh, Premier, I'm referring to the, uh, the chairman of the Gaming and Wagering Commission, and, and I ask, will you now replace the current chairman of the Gaming and Wagering Commission with an independent person with adequate gaming reg regulation experience as identified by the current chairman himself to ensure the integrity of gaming in Western Australia. The Premier. Look, um, Madam Speaker, the, the Royal Commission will make recommendations in relation to all these matters. Uh, we called the Royal Commission. The issues confronting Crown were occurring when you were in office. They were occurring when your government was in office. So we actually saw the outcome of the New South Wales inquiry and we put in place a Royal Commission to look at the issues. The first Royal Commission in Western Australia in 20 years or so. Uh, so we actually have taken action on these issues. In terms of who the chair of the Gaming Commission is, obviously that's something we'll consider uh, in due course. Uh, but uh, you know, our record is very clear. We have taken steps to deal with any issues of uh, propriety in relation to the casino, very strong steps, with the first Royal Commission in 20 years. Madam Speaker. The member for Geraldton. My question is to the Premier. 
I refer to the State Government's $2.2 million assistance package for those affected by Cyclone Saroja, and I ask, can the Premier outline to the House what this assistance will mean for those residents and businesses who are impacted by Cyclone Saroja, including those in communities across Greater Geraldton? Premier. Uh, Madam Speaker, can I firstly congratulate the member for Geraldton on her election and her very strong majority uh, in the uh, electorate of Geraldton at the state election there uh, six weeks or so ago. And I know she's a very, very hard community worker, and as you saw from her uh, first speech, uh, it was an outstanding effort, as indeed were many uh, first speeches of members uh, in this House. Uh, Madam uh, Madam Speaker, uh, just in uh, relation to Soakline Saroja, obviously it's been a difficult experience uh, for the communities uh, of Geraldton and North. Uh, we announced uh, a two point, an additional $2.2 million in assistance uh, for communities impacted. Uh, that was on top of the $2 million we provided to the Lord Mayor's Distress Relief Fund appeal. Uh, and in addition to the electricity, water, uh, financial relief pa packages and all of the support provided by the Department of uh, Communities. Uh, under this latest package, $4,000 will be provided to residents and businesses who are hardest hit by Cyclone Saroja. It will be targeted at those people who lost their homes or suffered significant damage uh, to their homes. Uh, for small businesses, it will be for those who suffered financially due to the cyclone and from access being shut uh, to uh, their communities, particularly tourism and hospitality businesses. Uh, we estimate there's at least 200 businesses that will benefit from uh, this assistance uh, and this uh, recovery. Uh, the recovery process is obviously being well uh, managed by the recovery controller and the relevant uh, ministers and agencies, uh, but it will be a long process. We put in a range of applications to the Commonwealth for disaster, disaster relief uh, funding as well, uh, as well as a range of other uh, assisted items of assistance to uh, the, uh, the local uh, communities. Uh, the recovery efforts are well underway, Madam Speaker. Uh, there has been um, enormous government effort. I'd like to thank everyone in the agencies in particular who have been up there doing the work. It's obviously difficult, somewhat uh, sometimes dangerous work uh, to fix these communities. Uh, and all the work that's been undertaken has allowed us to open the major roads into Kalbarri uh, as of uh, last Thursday, uh, which no doubt will be welcomed by uh, local tourism and hospitality businesses. Uh, the State Recovery Controller and the State Recovery Coordination Group is continuing to work to support uh, those communities. I understand it's a long road ahead. I appreciate the forbearance and patience of people involved, uh, and I thank everyone who's doing all the hard work up there. Yeah. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question today is to the Premier. Premier, I refer to the Auditor General's report into the regulation and support of the local government sector, which found the Department of Local Government, Sport and Cultural Industries is not providing efficient and effective regulation and support to the local government sector and lacks fundamental aspects of a good regulatory framework. And I ask, are you satisfied with the report's findings, which highlight multiple failings of the department? And is this gross mismanagement the reason you fired the Minister for Local Go Government and appointed the new one? From the Premier, thank you. Madam Speaker, I'm aware of some people who have been fired recently. It's not the, um, it's not the Minister for Tourism, uh, Madam Speaker. But, um, uh, Member, if you want detailed answers in re relation to that report, you should have given me some notice or asked the Minister for Local Government. Uh, but since you decided to impugn the character of the Minister for Tourism, uh, I, want to, uh, I want to staunchly defend him. Uh, he's an outstanding Minister. He is an outstanding minister and a terrific person, and a terrific person. He's one of the most. He is one of the most. He is one of the most. I think. I think I may have answered your question with my opening statement there. Uh, now, uh, Madam Speaker, he's an outstanding minister, a great local member of parliament, uh, and a valued member of this house by people on all sides. Uh, and I would. Uh, I would say to you. Uh, it's a bit mean-spirited on your behalf uh, to attack and impugn the character uh, of the Minister for Tourism in the way you have. Well liked, well liked on all sides and regarded as someone who uh, has done a uh, 
a good job in the portfolios he has held. Now, I realise some people have a bit of a vendetta against him, uh, but I think they're a very, very small minority uh, because most people know he's diligent, hardworking, decent, uh, effective uh, and uh, someone uh, who uh, doesn't, doesn't particularly play par partisan politics at all. Supplementary. Uh, supplementary to the Deputy Leader. Thank you. Um, Premier, what steps will you take to ensure that the serious issues that have been outlined by the Order of the General are addressed and rectified under your new minister? And are you comfortable that you've made that decision? Are you comfortable? Well, he's the Premier. Are you comfortable with your decision to appoint a minister on training wheels to address these serious issues? here would like to give the answer, but it's only the Premier that has the call. As I've said to you, um, you might want to give some notice about specific details about the report uh, so, that, uh, so that I can provide you with a uh, more comprehensive answer. I think uh, the Minister is, uh, is, uh, is uh, back, uh, back behind me uh, somewhere over here. Uh, the Minister is back behind me uh, over here. Uh, you might, um, you might uh, in your commentary, your negative commentary about this Minister now, note he's a former Mayor of the city of, of the town of Vincent uh, with deep and long experience both in local government and uh, in Walga and highly respected across the sector. Uh, so uh, I actually think uh, someone with that level of experience in local government uh, is worthy of being the Minister for Local Government. Uh, this Minister, the Minister for Tourism, I might also note, uh, was the former Deputy Mayor of Mandurah. Uh, and uh, as part of the Deputy Mayor's Club, yes. um, a very important club. there are some of us in this chamber, <laughs> uh, I am very defensive of people who are Deputy Mayors. Uh, and I think uh, this, uh, the member, Minister for Tourism, is also uh, the Leader of the House, uh, was well experienced and, again, well respected and well liked across local government. Now, uh, you know, you, uh, you, you, can, you can continue to come in here uh, being nasty and mean uh, and, uh, frankly, uh, awful, uh, or you could come in here sometimes and try and be a little bit constructive. That's your choice. The the member for Bateman. My question is to the Minister for Housing. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's unprecedented support for West Australians, West Australian homeowners, which has included a significant boost to Key Start. And I ask, can the minister update the House on how the work of the McGowan Labor government is helping more West Australians get into their first home, in particular those on low to moderate incomes? The Minister for Housing. Thank you. I thank the member for the question and the first question in this house. And bear, with, bear with me because my training wheels may fall off. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Speaker, uh, it is fair to say that for many West Australians, it is a major milestone, a, a first dream to own their own home. Uh, and I'm proud to be part of a government that is genuinely committed to achieving that aspiration, to get that first foot through the door. And Keystart is an obvious vehicle because it enables Western Australians who might not otherwise be able to, to given the hurdle of a first deposit, to get their home. And that's why I'm proud that we have enhanced the capacity of Key Start to enable so many more West Australians to get their first home. We've increased the borrowing limit, $243 million extra on the books, to enable more West Australians to borrow. And we've also changed the eligibility requirements, so we've lifted the thresholds for both singles and couples. And the dividend, the result, is very clear. It is very clear. The reports already indicate that on, from the last financial year, a 144% increase in the number of loans. It's estimated this financial year there will be 4,000 new loans. And most importantly, 81% of those new customers will be first home owners. 
These are great results. And I also want to say this, that the regions will also have their fair share. 200 million of those new loans are for homes in the regions. And it's supported and complemented by our $114 million regional land booster program. That is about releasing more affordable land into the regional markets. Now, those who aren't eligible for Keystart are still seizing the opportunity. Uh, and as the Premier reported to the Parliament, we are seeing extraordinary results, record growth, with more than 23,000 building approvals in the past 12 months. These are incredible figures, and I'm proud to say this clearly demonstrates that our WA recovery plan is working, that we've created a pipeline of work, that we've secured and protected the jobs of 65,000 workers in the residential construction sector, and of course, and most importantly, we've enabled thousands and thousands of new West Australians to achieve that first dream home. The Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Premier. Premier, I refer to the chaos in the Department of Local Government, Sport and Cultural Industries as evidenced in its documented failure in the regulation and support of the local government sector and the shocking revelations from the evidence presented to the Royal Commission into the Crown Casino yesterday and ask, do you concede that your government's sweep sweeping machinery of government changes have failed to deliver an efficient and effective government and instead created a bureaucratic mess? Good question. Good question. <laughs> Premier, supplementary, sorry. Supplementary question. Premier, how confident are you that these failures are not systemic throughout the public service? They are serious matters that have been raised by the Auditor-General and revelations by one of your own Director-Generals. Uh, Madam Premier. Speaker, uh, I indicated to the former member that uh, notice should be provided if you want specific <coughs> details about a specific uh, report. Uh, but I understand that the Department of Local Government is looking to implement the recommendations of the Auditor General's uh, inquiry uh, to uh, uh, put in place uh, any changes that might uh, be needed uh, out of that. Uh, in terms of the machinery of government changes, they've now been in place for four years. Mm. Four years. Chaos. I mean, be from the tone like of your, uh, from, from, the tone your question, from the Auditor General, from the tone saying of your questioning, uh, we should just have as many more government departments, just more and more and more. I mean, maybe we should have a hundred government departments. That, that that might solve the problem, according to you. Uh, that uh, you just every time you have an issue, you create a government department. So, uh, how many how many government departments do you want? No, we're just saying. Yeah, so you don't. Work, yeah, as, you're what you're learning, new members, is whenever you pose a question to them, they never have an answer. Uh, so we have um, what we have is 25 government departments, a 40% reduction. I think you'd find most people across the state would say it's better to have larger, more robust organisations that bring synergies between important areas uh, of government together. Most people would think that's a reasonable that's thing to do. That is a reasonable thing to do. Uh, and that's what our reforms have done. As I said, Jeff Kennett condensed the entire Victorian government down to eight departments. Eight. Uh, and uh, we've condensed the West Australian government, a, state, a third the population of Victoria, uh, down to 25 from 41. Now, obviously, under the arrangement that was there before, there, was, there had been no reform for decades. Uh, it was uh, too many, too many. And uh, there's synergies between the agencies that I think are, are plain uh, for all to see. And the way they're, they're structured uh, is obviously a sensible uh, way forward. Uh, we could perhaps have gone further. There were some that we could have gone further with. Uh, we elected not to because we thought uh, the biggest reorganisation in government, uh, perhaps in history, was probably uh, wise uh, to stop at about 25. Uh, but um, what's plain from what you have to say is you just think that um, there should be unlimited numbers of government departments. And all that does, all that does is breed small agencies uh, without great capability, more people in administration, less people in delivery. The member for Victoria Park. My question is to the Minister for Transport. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's record investment in transport projects across WA, including cycling infrastructure such as the new Swan River Causeway Bridge. And I ask, 
Can the Minister update the House on the work underway to deliver the new Causeway Bridge, including how this important project will support local jobs and local West Australian businesses? Minister for Transport. Member for Victoria Park for that question, and I also think it's your first question. Thank it you, is. Member for Victoria Park. Now, of course, what we're seeing across Western Australia is unprecedented expenditure <coughs> on our cycling network. So, across the state, throughout regional, throughout the suburbs, a significant boost to cycling expenditure. And can I acknowledge the member for Thornley for his work? also promoting cycling throughout Western Australia. A number of projects have been completed. Of course, the Mitchell Freeway PSP member for Balcatta has been completed. The Armidale Road PSP member for Armidale, member for Jandicott. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Also being completed. Of course, a lot of projects underway. We've got stage two of the Fremantle to Perth PSP, and I know the member for Cottesloe is a big supporter of that project, <laughs> and I thank him for his acknowledgement for that project too, because acknowledging good things helps to get re-elected member for Cottesloe. Look at that. <laughs> so stage. <laughs> Stage one, of course, of that Fremantle to Perth PSP has been completed. Stage two is underway, and ultimately they'll be connected right through to Fremantle. Of course, as part of our election com campaign, we've committed to improving the cycling network through Hillary's member for Hillary's, and of course, member for Geraldton, a significant boost. I'm looking for Geraldton. But It's very, very hard to keep track of where everybody is in this chamber. So, in relation to Geraldton, of course, a significant boost, and I know you're a big supporter of the investment of cycling infrastructure throughout Geraldton. But, of course, the PSP, the new cycling Causeway Cycling Bridge, is causing a lot of excitement out there. And more recently, we announced two, two tenderers going through to the next stage, and that is Sibmec and also Deck Mill. Of course, Sibmec. Um, produced, was a key producer of the beautiful Matagarra Bridge, a bridge that we supported, that we brought back to WA, that was locally produced, and what the Liberal Party criticised, we remember members, yeah. criticised the work on that beautiful bridge. Now, this new bridge, the new Causeway Bridge, will take more than 3,000 cyclists per day. The existing um, Causeway takes more than 3,000 cyclists and pedestrians per day. We think this is going to be a major boost, a major boost to cycling, support areas like Vic Park, like South Perth, member for South Perth, and of course the city, member for Perth. So a great new initiative that will be announcing a successful contract in the next six months. Well, I think it will be a new iconic bridge across the, um, across the Swan and one that will really help connect both sides and make cycling and walking even more attractive to more people in WA. The Leader of the Liberal Party. My question is to the Premier. Premier, are you aware that a security guard involved in hotel quarantine has been stood down and another is under investigation for non-compliance with the secondary employment rule? And I ask, which hotel were these guards working at and what are the second jobs that these workers had? The, uh, the uh, Madam Acting Speaker, I'm unaware uh, of uh, any incident of that uh, nature, uh, but uh, I do know uh, that we brought in a uh, range of changes, um, in, indeed contractual arrangements, uh, to ensure that uh, people working in hotel quarantine in those areas uh, re were required not to have another job in order, to, in order to protect the public. So if someone has been stood down for breaching those rules, that would be in accordance uh, with the uh, requirements that we brought in. Supplementary question? The supplementary question to the Leader of the Liberal Party. Uh, Premier, given that the safety of the WA communities relies on thousands of hotel quarantine workers uh, doing the right thing, are you confident that we have the processes to stop those people having second jobs, or does the government need to look further into this matter? They're already working. Sorry, you've already asked working the supplementary. We'll have the yeah. answer now, Premier. Uh, well, the premise of the question, uh, which I'll get checked, was that someone has been stood down because they breached the rules. That's the premise of the question. 
So uh, if someone has been stood down because they breached the rules, um, that would indicate the rules are working. Um, so um, I, think, I, think that's, I think that's just logical. They've already got um, second job. So, uh, so, Madam Speaker, uh, in hotel event. quarantine, we're dealing with people. We're dealing actually with thousands of people at any one point in time. Uh, and uh, if people breach the rules and uh, they're uncovered, well, then being stood down is an obvious consequence of doing it. They received a 40 per cent pay increase. And uh, that 40 per cent pay increase was on the basis they do the right thing. Now, obviously, working in hotel quarantine, just so you know, uh, it's uh, long hours, um, all hours of the day and night, um, probably at times quite boring. Um, and uh, uh, we have uh, a range of people who ordinarily would have a range of jobs. So they might do that and then they might do other part-time employment in different areas. What we sought to do, uh, and I think we did it back in perhaps January, February, uh, was remove those opportunities for other jobs. And if the system is working, then that's a good thing. In terms of other things we've done, we've just implemented mandatory vaccinations, uh, so people working in hotel quarantine have mandatory vaccinations. And, and we've also put in place a daily testing regime. So you think about that. All the people who go into what's could term the red zone in hotel quarantine are required to get tested every single day. Every single day they're at work. And when they're on leave, there's a testing regime as well. Not every day, but a testing regime when they're actually on leave. Uh, we've uh, upped the requirement for PPE. We're phasing out three hotels. Uh, they're on the cusp of being phased out as we speak. A um, whole range of things to keep the system safe and secure, uh, and we'll continue to do so. But as I've said repeatedly, the system itself is not perfect. It was never designed for these purposes. Uh, but we've had 45,000 people come through it, returning Australians. Uh, what uh, needs to happen, of course, is there needs to be much more careful analysis by the Commonwealth of people leaving the country, wherever they may be going, uh, so we don't have people leaving the country, then joining the list and displacing people who might have been trying to get on the list uh, already overseas. Uh, so there's a range of changes that can be made at a federal level, but as you can see from what I've said, uh, the state level there's been huge improvements put in place. The member for Riverton. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Innovation and ICT. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's continued investment in creating local jobs and supporting new West Australian industries. And I ask, can the Minister update the House as to how this government's investment in the Innovation Voucher Program is supporting local WA businesses and helping create local jobs? The Minister for Innovation. Madam Speaker, I thank the member for Riverton for his question and also for his outstanding election victory in the seat of Riverton and his, um, his very touching speech about his journey to this place. So congratulations, Riverton. Now, the Innovation Voucher Program is part of the McGowan Government's New Industries Fund, Madam Speaker, and is part of our agenda to diversify the WA economy and support small business. Since its inception, the Innovation Vouchers Program has supported 178 metropolitan and regional small businesses. And since 2017, 96 of those vouchers were provided by the McGowan Labor Government. And I'd like to tell you about two examples, Madam Speaker. Vital Trace received a voucher in 2017, and since then has grown from two employees to 16 and raised $1.3 million in capital. It has also funded th three patents underway with another five planned and the founders of Vital Trace have described how receiving a voucher in 2017 was the majority of their budget for that year and allowed them to reach proof of concept, which in turn led to their initial seed capital funding. Now Vital Trace is a biosensor device and it's designed to improve, the improve safety during the natural process of childbirth, so a tremendous West Australian innovation. And Sotra Analytics is the second one, has developed the world's first wearable solution, an artificial intelligence-driven coaching program to prevent back and shoulder injuries in the workplace by up to 55%. Since 2017, Sotra Analytics has increased its employee numbers from three to 28. 
The company has raised approximately 2.5 million Australian and has multiple patents underway and has now expanded to new markets in the UK, USA and Europe. Now we know on this side, in the, in the McGowan Labor government, the importance of accelerating our agenda to diversify the WA economy. And that's why in 2020, Madam Speaker, the McGowan Labor government significantly expanded the IVP program from 20 vouchers to 36, total value of 690,000 to provide additional support to WA innovators during COVID-19. I recently opened the 2021 round of the program, which calls for applications by Tuesday the 25th of May. So I'm very proud to be part of the McGowan Labor Government that's committed to diversifying the West Australian economy through innovation and some great examples there of the work that's been achieved. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member for Vass. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Where you misled the House that a quarantine advisory panel had been established, now, and I ask, Member, I ask you to just sit down. Uh, that point of order is upheld. I, I don't need to hear it. Uh, your question contains an imputation. Uh, I'd ask you to remove that and rephrase your question. Uh, my question is to the Premier. I refer to your comments last Wednesday, where you stated that a quarantine advisory panel had been established, and I ask, can you confirm that this panel has now been established? Two, why has it taken over 60 days for you to act on this recommendation, given these hotels are the front line against this deadly disease? And three, who is the new chair, if it's not Professor Wiramanthri, as incorrectly stated last week? The uh, Madam Speaker, we'll, we'll announce further details around uh, the quarantine advisory panel, I expect, uh, later this week. Obviously, there's some uh, consultation going on as to who the membership would be. Uh, I think my words last week was my understanding uh, was it was Professor Wiramanthri. My understanding was incorrect, uh, and I corrected the record the next day in question time. Uh, so, I mean, uh, if you want to make something of that, feel free. Uh, but um, I think what it shows is uh, all our efforts in relation to COVID, the Liberal Party continues to undermine. Uh, supplementary, which I'll caution you just needs to be brief and to the point. Supplementary. Um, Premier, given your lacklustre response to this recommendation and your delays in improving hotel Sorry, quarantine... Member, when I ask for a question, that's exactly what I want. I don't want the preamble. I want the question for a supplementary. What confidence can the public have that you will act on the recommendations from this newly formed panel with the urgency it deserves? Uh, so, Madam Speaker, the panel itself is to be formed yet. It's still to be formed. Uh, it will be formed and provide us with advice in relation for ongoing advice in relation in relation to issues else. related to quarantine. Uh, but I just know, I just know, Western Australia has had one of the best responses to dealing with the pandemic of any jurisdiction in the entire world. In the entire world. We have, we have, had, we have had the most outstanding public health response and the most outstanding economic response of any jurisdiction in Australia and probably any jurisdiction in the entire world. Yet, for some reason, the member for VAS thinks that's not good enough. So other countries around the world, other countries around the world, Madam Speaker, have had tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people die, die in the streets, die in the corridors. They've had economic dislocation, the likes of which haven't been seen since 1929. They've had death rates, the likes of which they haven't seen since the Second World War. That's the experience all over the world. And in Western Australia, uh, we have run a hotel quarantine system, never designed for it, in which we've had 45,000 people uh, come back through it, and we've had a handful of incidents, despite the fact we put in place some of the strongest protections you'd ever see. And what we've seen in South Australia, Liberal State, good friends with Stephen Marshall, but Liberal State, they've had an incident in hotel quarantine uh, over the course of the last day, because, because it was never designed for those purposes. And every state knows it. Every state in the Commonwealth knows it. The Commonwealth won't take on the responsibility because they know it's too hard. Because they know it's too difficult. Because they know there's risk involved. So we took on the responsibility, but we're making it as safe as we possibly humanly can. 
despite all of that, despite all of the trauma, despite all of the effort, despite the minister and myself virtually every single day meeting for hours and making decisions and allocating money and resources and questioning advice and ensuring all sorts of things take place across Western Australia over the course of the last 15 months to keep our state safe, it's not good enough for the Liberal Party. This is the same party that at the height of the pandemic joined Clive Palmer. At the height of the pandemic joined Clive Palmer. Out there in the High Court backing his action. In public, your leader, in this House, your leader, as she then was, now private citizen, was out there, was out there, backing Clive Palmer. Backing Clive Palmer. Every time an issue came up, criticism, undermining. That's what occurred. I can bring you in all the quotes if you like. You were sitting there, member, right behind her, backing her all the way. That's the experience of this state over the course of the last 15 months. And I tell you what, if you think the public hasn't noticed the way you conducted yourself and the experience uh, over the course of last year, well, I think you're misrepresenting the evidence of March 13. The member for Warren Blackwood was a little slow to her feet, but congratulations on your first question. Thank you. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Water. I refer to the impacts climate change is having on West Australian farmers through reduced rainfall, and I ask, can the Minister update the House on how the McGowan Labor Government is supporting farmers in dealing with the challenges caused by climate change? And can the Minister advise the House on how the Federal Government can support these efforts? The Minister. Uh, Madam, Madam Speaker, I want to thank the member for her question. It's absolutely fantastic to have uh, her in the House and congratulations on your victory uh, in Warren Blackwood. Uh, look, members, uh, despite the, the recent rains, we've had some uh, pretty good rain in the last uh, couple of weeks, the, the impacts of climate change in Western Australia are stark. The southwest of Western Australia is one of the places on the planet most impacted upon by declining rainfall due to climate change. That in Western Australia has had significant consequences. Since 2019, we have dealt with, in our first term of government, an unprecedented 12 water deficiency declarations. There's only ever been two previously. We had 12 or have 12 currently in place. Now, that requires us to cart water to farmers so that they can provide stock, uh, water for their stock. Now, that comes at significant cost and significant uh, difficulty and stress for the farmers uh, involved. In addition to doing that, uh, since in 1920, we spent $1.5 million on 37 community water projects to upgrade dams across the Great Southern and the Wheat Belt so that non-potable supplies were available to the farming community, notwithstanding the declining rainfall. But we're not resting on our laurels. Uh, in February of this year, just before the election, we announced a project to upgrade 70 uh, AA dams across the Great Southern and the Wheat Belt, a $7.3 million project, the biggest investment of its type in that area for decades. 70 dams would be upgraded to provide non-potable supplies to farmers who are facing difficulties. Now, that uh, project will be funded $3.65 million from the state government. Again, an unprecedented amount of investment uh, from a state government. Uh, and the other 50% of that project, we have made an application to the Commonwealth uh, to their National Water Grid uh, Authority. Now, today is Federal Budget Day. Uh, we hope to get good news from the Federal Government that they are going to uh, support our project uh, through the Federal Government, through the Federal Budget, through the National Water Grid uh, Authority. Now, members would be aware that uh, much of the spending of, by the Commonwealth on water infrastructure has been centred on the East Coast. Uh, something like $12 billion spent, most of it on the Murray-Darling, only 2 per cent of it uh, to uh, Western Australian projects. So on this side of the House, 
we have a strong record of uh, taking action on climate change, supporting farmers when uh, uh, they need it. What we're now asking for this new project, 70 dam upgrades across the Great Southern uh, and the wheat belt. What we're asking, we've put up 50% of the money. We're asking for the Commonwealth to start to see some of that water infrastructure funding flow to WA. Let's see what they say in tonight's budget. Thank you. The a member for North West Central with the last question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, I refer uh, to uh, calls from industry for a government-backed events cancellation insurance fund amid growing concern about the future of festivals and events in WA. And I ask, one, are you aware that more than 500 events and festivals had to be cancelled at short notice following the Anzac weekend lockdown directives? Two, are you aware that the event organisers behind events like the Bindu Show of uh, 2021 and other community events have made the decision to cancel 2021 shows due to the ongoing instability and uncertainty? And three, have you sought advice on the COVID-19 event cancellation insurance fund as reported in the West Australian on April 28 that you would? Uh, thank you, uh, Member, for the question. Uh, Madam Speaker, um, we, are, um, we are investigating uh, this, uh, this issue. I uh, just want to make a few points, though. There's a whole range of events still going on in Western Australia. Uh, and indeed, uh, last year we were the first state to sort of reopen, if you like, uh, to allow for events and functions and uh, activity uh, before any other state. Uh, so uh, all of that uh, activity went on here before anywhere else. And as I said repeatedly to uh, opposition questions uh, last year, uh, the best thing you can do for the events industry is have events. Um, and so. Uh, we, uh, we were able uh, to do that. Uh, in relation to an events uh, fund, uh, that's a matter that Treasury is currently uh, considering. But having said that, there were a range of, uh, uh, there were a range of uh, support initiatives uh, that were taken uh, to assist uh, the events industry. Uh, there was a uh, program launched by the uh, Minister for Culture uh, and the Arts uh, that, uh, that uh, allowed for uh, rental fee waivers. Um, and I think there was also an underwriting scheme uh, for a range of events that we brought, brought in um, last year. And it's, both of them have received hundreds of, uh, hundreds of, uh, hundreds of applications. Uh, and uh, $15 million was allocated to the Getting the Show Back on the Road uh, program, including venue fee waiver and a shared risk program. So in effect, we've already done this. And I think that hasn't been uh, widely acknowledged, and that was part of our recovery plan uh, last year. Uh, the other parts of the recovery plan were the upgrade of the uh, concert hall uh, and uh, uh, the, the, His Majesty's uh, Theatre uh, and uh, uh, allocation of $6 million towards the Holocaust uh, Education Centre and Museum in uh, Yokine, the $15 million getting the show back on the road. There's the program that supports uh, regional um, arts and uh, concerts and the like, which is uh, from memory $20, $20 million or thereabouts, uh, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, rolling out. Uh, there's the $5 million lottery, lottery West investment in the Creative Communities Recovery Artists in Residency uh, Program. We allocated $2 million towards the Aboriginal uh, Cultural Centre and a range of other uh, programs around the state. Uh, obviously, COVID isn't easy. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, you mentioned a Ming and event. Uh, events uh, may not go ahead because the organisers don't want to put in COVID plans or whatever the case may be, uh, but we work as best we can with event organisers to make sure they happen.